Today, the U.S. to push for a truce in Gaza, despite Hamas blaming Israel for derailing ceasefire talks. Also ahead, the Prime Minister criticised by his own backbencher for watering down gambling reforms. Ukrainian forces destroy a key bridge in Russia as they create a buffer zone in Russia's Kursk region. And increasing extreme weather events found to be the main reason home insurance is costing more in Australia. Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Ros Childs. Hamas has accused Israel of derailing Gaza ceasefire negotiations by making up new conditions and refusing to compromise on others. It comes as US Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel in his ninth visit to the region since the October the 7th attacks on Israel. Mediators are hoping to prevent a wider war after Iran and its allies threatened retaliation for assassinations in Tehran and Lebanon. Middle East correspondent Eric Twarczyk has more from Jerusalem. The United States has tried to take control of these talks, telling everyone there was a final deal put to the parties and it was going to be accepted by the end of the week. Now Hamas says that's a lie. It says the US has essentially taken Israel's side in the negotiations and accepted positions that Hamas was never going to agree to, such as Israel retaining a military presence inside the Gaza Strip, retaining control of the border with Egypt and not agreeing to a permanent ceasefire. Those things were always red lines for Hamas and it says it cannot agree to a ceasefire under those terms. It says it did, however, agree to a proposal put forward last month and it blames Israel for imposing new conditions in excess of that deal. Israel, for its part, says Hamas is being obstinate. The Israeli Prime Minister, though, has conceded there are some conditions upon which Israel cannot afford to be flexible. He says the pressure needs to be put on Hamas to accept the current deal that's on the table. I want to emphasize that we are conducting negotiations and not that we will just give and give. The U.S. is right about one thing, though, and that is there's an extreme urgency to get a ceasefire in Gaza. Not only are lives being lost every day, but the U.N. says there's a need for a seven-day ceasefire in order to vaccinate thousands of Gazan children from polio, a disease which has started to, to, to reappear in Gaza for the first time in decades. It's a debilitating disease that thrives in poor sanitary conditions, which are currently rife in Gaza, especially as the zone for humanitarian uh, people for displaced Gazans continues to shrink as Israel issues more and more evacuation orders. Then there's the looming threat of attacks by the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah and Iran. Iran had indicated it would withhold its promised revenge for Israel's presumed assassination of a Hamas leader in Tehran, and it followed that its ally Hezbollah would also withhold its retaliation for a Hezbollah leader in Beirut. If the ceasefire talks collapse, it's presumed that those two strikes are back on the table, and also with them the threat of an all-out regional war. And later this hour, we'll be speaking to a representative from MSF about efforts to prevent a polio outbreak in Gaza. The federal government will again try to pass urgent legislation today to try and install administrators at the troubled CFMEU. The opposition and the Greens teamed up to vote down the bill last week after Labour refused to include a ban on political donations in the legislation. Political reporter Isabel Rowe joins us now from Parliament House. Hi, Isabel. So where are negotiations up to? Well, Roz, there's been a lot of discussion between the government and the coalition over the weekend to try and uh, come to an agreement, and they have. There are 10 amendments that Labor has agreed to um, with this bill, which essentially puts uh, the CFMEU into administration, puts a, an administrator in charge of it. And that is because, as we've heard over the last uh, few weeks, there have been allegations of bikey infiltration and criminal infiltration right to the top of the union. Now, the Workplace Relations uh, Minister, Murray Watt, introduced this bill last week, but he couldn't get it past the Senate. The Coalition and the Greens teamed up to vote it down. The Coalition says the bill doesn't go far enough. 
uh, and the Greens said that it goes too far. But what has been agreed on are amendments such as uh, extending the time of the administration from three to five years, uh, putting a, a whistleblower protection uh, uh, measure in there for people within the union, um, and also the ability um, for the administrator to report to the minister and the parliament every six months. Now, there's been uh, some action on this uh, in the Senate just this morning. The coalition has uh, put forward a motion motion noting the Greens' conspicuous silence on this, and Labor has supported that motion. The Workplace, Rel Minister, Workplace Relations Minister Murray Watt has accused uh, the Greens of um, not supporting the bill because it wants donations, and he got quite uh, a um, raucous response from the Greens. Here's a little bit of that exchange earlier. Why are the Greens so unwilling to support legislation that would enable the CFMEU to be put into administration? And I think the answer lies probably in a sound, and that sound is chitching. It's the money. It's the money that the Greens so desperately want. And we know, Senator Shrewbridge, you more than anyone have been running around Order. Parliament telling Senator everyone Watt, you're looking forward to taking your... money off Senator Labor Watt, please and into the Greens' pocket. The we chair. know that. Order, we Senator know Watt, that. I... That is not at all. And it's personal. There are multiple standing orders that the minister just defended. And as my colleague just contributed, you're the ones that have been taking the money, Order, not Senator us. Waters. So Order, how Order, very Senator dare Waters. you make those baseless Senator allegations? Waters. Retract Order, them now. Senator Waters, I don't think that was a point of order. On another topic then, Isabel, the government has come under fire for its approach to gambling ad reform. Yes, this has been a controversial issue as well for the government. Uh, the late um, MP Peter Murphy conducted an inquiry into uh, gambling ads and, and gambling reform and found that uh, all gambling ads should be banned on uh, TV and radio and newspapers. And the government is currently trying to determine its response to that report. Uh, and it has been drafting some laws which uh, a lot of um, uh, lobby groups say don't go far enough. Um, those laws are are, for example, um, uh, limiting gambling advertising to two spots per hour, a ban during games and a ban at specific times that children are watching. One of the Labor backbenchers, Mike Freelander, has uh, come out publicly criticising his own government's uh, apparent position on this. He's called the government's uh, laws as they stand disgusting and he says we're being softened up and pummeled by the gambling industry. So those are very strong comments from a government backbencher. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, was asked about this earlier today on the ABC's AM program. He says he respects Mike Freelander, uh, but he doesn't agree with his comments. And so that issue will be another one that will be kicking along um, as Parliament sits this week. Isabel, thank you. In the red soil of the top end, a new industry is emerging, cotton. On tonight's Four Corners, Angus Grigg examines the conflicts of interest that some say will lead to the destruction of some of the Northern Territory's most famous tourism destinations. They are the lifeblood of the Northern Territory. The big rivers, wild and free-flowing. Fed by pristine springs and a network of ancient groundwater. Look at this place. It's deadly fishing, swimming, the tourists love it. Beneath the red dirt lies a vast water resource. And here in the top end, it's free. Developers are circling. Absolutely a water grab. They're fighting for water from the top and down to the desert. I think it comes back to this political imperative for development. And I hate to say it, perhaps development at any cost. The red carpet is being rolled out for a new industry, cotton. It's a lucrative crop with a troubled history. We are not the Murray-Darling Basin. I think there is a sense that cotton is a dirty word. Now growers are eyeing off water, but access to it in the NT has been mired in secret deals 
and cosy relationships. This created really a dysfunctional arrangement. I had to ask, what hat are you wearing today? I should negotiate first before they started doing cotton here. The government is shutting down independent science. We're really at risk of establishing some kind of fake science war. Have you been told personally by department officials to keep quiet? Yes. And what's at stake goes well beyond politics. Without those flows, they dry up. Look, it, it could be catastrophic, absolutely catastrophic. What is life? Without it, we'll all perish. Angus Gregg is with me in the studio now. Hi there, Angus. So is water really being given away for free and why? Yeah, I know. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it, when you, when you say it like that. Um, we're seeing some really massive water licences, some of the biggest water licences in the country, given away for free. And the sort of numbers we're talking are giant. So there's a water licence that's under uh, application at Larimer, which is just near the famous springs at Mataranka, the Roper River there, which many people might know. So that's a 10,000 mega, megalitre water licence. So it's actually physically difficult to pump that much water in a year. Um, but if that licence was to be sold in the Murray-Darling Basin today, it could be worth upwards of $50 million. Um, there's been a licence given away to the Paspaley family, who have a big uh, station there called Dry River. Um, it's worth about $15 million, that licence, and it was given away for free. So I guess the thing is that this, uh, like, you know, coal underground or iron ore, water is a public resource. And the fact that it's been given to a very small number of people mm. for their own personal gain um, is really one of the big questions that we look at in the story tonight. And is it legal to grow cotton on a pastoral lease? Yeah, this is this sort of another quite extraordinary thing. Um, so most of the land in the Northern Territory is either uh, Aboriginal land or it is uh, pastoral leases. And um, pastoral lease is basically government land crown land that's been leased out for the grazing of cattle and so one of the quirks of that is that it has a very specific purpose and so growing commercial crops on a pastoral lease uh, is to say the best thing is, is a legally grey area and indeed there's a lot of people that have taken legal advice that this is not legal. Um, so we have this sort of slightly strange situation where literally tens of billions of dollars have poured into the Northern Territory to, to clear land, to buy new machinery, to you know, upgrade technology. There's a new cotton gin there that's cost $70 million. So we've had this huge investment come into a sector uh, and we're not even sure if it's actually legal to grow this cotton um, on most of that land. And so even the Northern Territory government themselves, and, and we asked the minister this very question, is it legal? And she says, yes. And then I said, well, have you actually taken legal advice on that? And she says, no, that would just be my opinion. So it's a very strange situation where the government is turning a blind eye, growers are emboldened by that, but were this to be challenged in court, um, there's a lot of strong legal opinion that says it would go down. And what are scientists concerned about then, Angus? Yeah, this is probably the third element of this story, is this the sheer volume of water that is being extracted, um, particularly around that area around Mataranka and Larimer. And so there's been some really big existing licences already given out there, and they're already having an impact on the minimum groundwater levels around the Roper River and the Bitter Springs. And what scientists really worry about is that if these new licences go ahead, that there will be a sort of further deterioration in those river systems. So what they're actually worried about is the Roper River during the dry season, it will stop flowing. So it'll essentially be a dead river. Um, so that'll have just a huge impact, um, not only on those communities, but, you know, a huge sort of uh, tourism industry that, you know, is very famous for barramundi fishing and things like that. So, I mean, I think the real concern that scientists have is that they say there is lots of scientific evidence that too much water is being taken, but the Northern Territory Government are ignoring this science and indeed sort of going a step further and labelling some of it misinformation and sort of setting up this, you know, phony science war, if you like, and particularly discrediting those who come from outside the Northern Territory who are coming and saying, look, there's problems here. Angus, thank you. Thanks, Ros. So don't miss Four Corners tonight at 8.30 Eastern on ABC TV and on iView.
Hundreds of thousands of Sydney commuters are taking the city's new metro train line after weeks of delays. Charlie Mills reports from Chatswood Station. In a major overhaul of the Sydney public transportation system, the metro line from Chatswood to Sydney has opened to commuters today. The Minister for Transport has lauded the move, calling it one of the biggest steps in infrastructure in decades. Here is a bit of what she had to say earlier. This is an incredible day for our city and means that more people will be able to choose public transport more often. And that means it is absolutely cementing our city as a truly great global city. This is the biggest change to the way our city moves since the Harbour Bridge has opened. This train will be able to carry more people than the Harbour Bridge and the tunnel combined during the peak hour and really takes the pressure off the rest of our public transport network, particularly the busy T1 Northern Line. The opening is a long-awaited one. It was supposed to open two weeks ago, but it was delayed when the National Rail Safety Regulator didn't tick off in time. That approval for the $21 billion line was given last week, and authorities announced that it would open to commuters this morning. There has been many excited train enthusiasts here at Chatswood this morning, taking photos and videos of the new metro line and taking the chance to get on board. We spoke to a few of them here at Chatswood Station today and on the train. Take a listen. It really does not affect us in the slightest, but it's still super exciting to have this like new thing open. Uh, definitely awesome. It definitely cuts like cuts down a lot of time between Sydney to get to the northern side of Sydney and the northwest. I think my favorite part would be from Sydney to Chatswood because that part always annoys me because how time consuming it is and how curvy the line gets. There is some real excitement today as customers get accustomed to this new metro line, but they are being warned to check the website and plan ahead. Ukraine says it's destroyed a second strategic bridge in Russia's Kursk region as part of its cross-border incursion. Kyiv has released video it says shows the aftermath of an explosion on the structure which it hopes will disrupt Russian supply routes. Ukraine claims it seized more than 80 settlements over 1,150 square kilometres since launching its surprise raid almost two weeks ago. Tens of thousands of civilians have been evacuated. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says the operation aims to create a buffer zone. Today we achieved good and much needed results in destroying Russian equipment. And all this is more than just defence for Ukraine. It is now our primary task in defensive operations overall to destroy as much Russian war potential as possible and conduct maximum counter-offensive actions. This includes creating a buffer zone on the aggressor's territory, our operation in the Kursk region. At an undisclosed location, the Ukrainian army is conducting drills as it forces advance deeper into Russia. Ukraine soldiers have been buoyed by their territorial gains over the border after fighting Moscow's invasion for more than two and a half years. The armed forces of Ukraine demonstrate right now how warfare will look in the future. We are writing history in this very moment. We're showing the whole world how to fight a war in the 21st century. And Russia continues to step up attacks in Ukraine. Kyiv says this crater near the capital was caused by Moscow's third ballistic missile attack on the city this month. Strikes are also being increased in the eastern Sumy region. Many civilians there have been forced to flee their homes, saying since the incursion, the situation has become too dangerous. It is worse now. They are bombing a lot with glider bombs. Those are very dangerous. They can blow up half a street, including the windows and the people. With the offensive, our soldiers have driven back the Russian artillery. With planes, they can still carry out attacks. We were just patient until our patience ran out. It's so dangerous that we can't stay any longer. Meanwhile, Belarus has warned tensions are high along its border with Ukraine. The Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, who's a staunch ally of Russia's Vladimir Putin, claims there's been a massive build-up of Ukraine's troops along the border, despite Kyiv saying the situation there remains unchanged. There are over 120,000 Ukrainian troops on the Belarusian-Ukrainian border. They are keeping them near our border. Seeing their aggressive policy, we have introduced there and placed in certain points our military along the entire border. In case of war, they would be defence. 
In the US, the Democratic Party is making final preparations for its national convention, where Kamala Harris is due to officially accept her party's nomination for the presidential race. North America correspondent Carrington Clark is in Chicago. America's third largest city and the Democratic Party are preparing for this four-day-long extravaganza, which effectively amounts to a Democratic coronation of Vice President Kamala Harris. Although she's already been officially endorsed as the Democratic candidate for this year's presidential election, this allows her to receive all the pomp and circumstance of a convention, and the Democratic Party knows that they will receive a huge amount of domestic and international media attention. And that's an opportunity to try to define Kamala Harris in the minds of the American public. She might have been the vice president for the last three and a half years, but for many, she's still an unknown quantity, and they want to hear where she stands on some of the big issues facing this country. The vice president enters this convention, though, with huge amounts of momentum. Polls suggest that the race is increasingly tight with former president Donald Trump, and some are actually putting her potentially ahead of him, particularly in those key swing states which will determine this year's election. The convention itself uh, will receive a cast of party luminaries, including former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who will speak on the first day, which is tomorrow, uh, alongside uh, the current President Joe Biden. We'll also hear later in the week from former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and then Kamala Harris herself will finish the event on Thursday local time, where she will receive the party's endorsement and give the keynote address. Her competitor, Donald Trump, will be spending this week going through some of those key swing states. We've heard from leading Republicans that they want to see a more disciplined performance from the former president. They want him focusing on some of those issues that they say uh, they see as weaknesses of the Biden-Harris administration, including the economy, more specifically inflation and immigration. In recent days, he has appeared to want to stay on message when he's given speeches, held rallies, uh, but often he's veered off course and again has personally insulted his competitor, uh, accusing Kamala Harris of being uh, crazy and also suggesting that he believes he is better looking than she is. One of the tricky points for Kamala Harris is the war in Gaza. And although here within the United Centre we're expected to see huge amounts of enthusiasm and support for the VP, outside tens of thousands of people are expected to take to the streets to protest the Biden administration's role in the war on Gaza. And one of the issues that Kamala Harris will need to address for the progressive base of the Democratic Party is how she will differentiate herself from Joe Biden on this issue. The other tricky issue for Kamala Harris is that she hasn't held either a press conference or participated in a sit-down interview since she became the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party, and there's increasing pressure on her to do so. Carrington Clark there. Failed online retailer Booktopia has been saved by a new owner who's going to keep the Australian website going. But customers owed millions of dollars worth of books are still in limbo, with it appearing the deal doesn't cover company debts. Reporter Amelia Turzon has been following the story and joins me now in the studio. Hey, Amelia. Uh, so who's bought Booktopia and what are the terms of the deal? So Booktopia has been bought up by DigiDirect, which is a electronics website and it has a handful of stores mostly around Sydney. We don't know a whole lot about the terms of the deal yet. My understanding is that the buy-up cost from DigiDirect is nowhere near the $60 million in debt that Booktopia had when it went under just two months ago. Uh, we've been trying to get onto DigiDirect today. We have got a statement th from this company through the administrators of Booktopia which hints that they are looking to potentially cover customers who had gift vouchers when Booktopia collapsed. Mm. So we know that there was about $3 million in gift vouchers owed to customers. Potentially they might be honoured now that the website is being rebooted. Uh, we do also know that DigiDirect uh, wants to hire at least 100 employees and it's said that it very much welcomes applications from the former employees of Booktopia when it went under. But so far that's really all we know. So $60 million in debt outstanding. Who did it owe that money to and will 
Will the, those creditors get their money back? So the vast majority of the debt was to publishers. So publishers, very big ones, small publishers who had sold Booktopia books, uh, they generally operated on supply terms of payment within 30 days of receiving much of that $60 million was to publishers. Uh, we do understand that lots of publishers had credit insurance that might have covered some of those money that they were owed. Uh, however, as I said before, we still don't know if this uh, deal mm. to DigiDirect will actually cover the publishers who haven't managed to get some of that cash back. We also know that around uh, $12 million in orders was owed to customers of Booktopia people who have now been waiting months to get books that they bought. Uh, we don't know if they will get their money back out of this deal. Uh, some people did manage to get refunds through their credit providers like PayPal after Booktopia collapsed. So is this deal being welcomed by those publishers that you've spoken to? I have been just texting some publishers and they are mostly welcoming the deal because DigiDirect is an e-commerce player. They've also said that it has cash, which means that going forward uh, they can have orders still from the new owners. I would also say here that the really big concern from Booktopia collapsing was that its main rival was Amazon and without a Australian local rival to that US giant, there was concern that Australian publishing especially would be disadvantaged. So it has been welcomed by publishers who say, well, it's good. We've got another Australian competitor in the marketplace still. Amelia, thank you. Queensland Cricket has confirmed that no test matches will be held at the Gabba in 2026 and 2027. That's due to the state government's decision to abandon the venue's redevelopment. Reporter Ariana Levy has the details. Well, this has certainly been quite a controversial topic here in Queensland. Now, the Gabba redevelopment plan was only really announced by the Palaget government ahead of the Olympics that are set to be hosted right here in Brisbane in 2032. But earlier this year, the Miles government came in and abandoned that plan, citing major cost blowouts, and instead opted to fund a number of venues across the city, including the Brisbane showgrounds for major sporting codes like Queensland cricket and the AFL. But this has certainly come as quite quite a blow to Queensland cricket. They've said that no test matches will be held post the 2026-2027 season and it does follow yesterday's afternoon when Cricket Australia unveiled their allocation for the men's international cricket hosting rights which is for the next seven seasons. Now that only includes the Gabba for the next two years and they say that that's largely due to the fact that there's still a lot of uncertainty around the development and they say that they are in ongoing talks with the association and about the future of cricket here in Queensland. But this will be the first time in nearly 50 years that no test match is held at a Brisbane stadium. So in response, Queensland Cricket penned an open letter in which they said that the Gabba, they've become quite disappointed that the Gabba has become another casualty of the ongoing uncertainty surrounding Olympic infrastructure. They've also said that other major stadiums in other states have now become more commercially attractive and fan-friendly over the Gabba. And they've called on leaders here in the state as we head closer to the state election to become more bold in their decision making and to make sure they plan for long-term decisions as well in terms of sport. Now certainly this is no doubt going to raise more questions over the future of cricket here in Queensland. Ariana Levy. Quick look at the national weather now. Brisbane and Sydney partly cloudy. Canberra a cloudy day. Partly cloudy in Melbourne and Hobart. Adelaide showers developing. A shower or two in Perth and Darwin. A sunny day and a top there of 32 degrees. This is ABC News. Our top story is Washington's top diplomat, Antony Blinken, has travelled to the Middle East as the US and mediators push for a new ceasefire deal between Hamas and Israel. The two parties have traded blame for the stall negotiations, with Hamas accused of accusing Israel of making up new conditions. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says there are some conditions Israel won't compromise on. The Prime Minister has defended the government's approach to gambling reform after Labour backbencher Mike Freelander criticised the party's position. Dr Freelander is calling for a full ban on gambling advertising, as recommended in an inquiry more than a year ago. 
Labour is instead proposing a limit to advertising outside of games and a ban during play. Ukraine's president says his country's military incursion into Russia's Kursk region aims to create a buffer zone to prevent further border attacks by Moscow. Ukraine says it's destroyed a second strategic bridge in the region two weeks into its offensive in Russian territory. Moscow has called the incursion a major provocation. And the Insurance Council of Australia says extreme weather events are the main driver behind rising home insurance costs. Their report found the cost associated with natural disasters has more than tripled over the past three decades. The council says flooding is the main weather event driving up expenses. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says the aim of an incursion into Russia's Kursk region is to prevent further attacks by Moscow. The offensive marks the first time in more than 80 years that a foreign army has seized and occupied Russian territory. The attack has shocked the Russian public as they'd been led to believe that their country's border was safely guarded. This is Alexin, a 700-year-old town about 100 miles from Moscow. And I've come here to find out what people think about the dramatic situation which has been unfolding in Kursk region with the Ukrainian incursion. With Ukrainian soldiers now in Russia, Lyubov tells me that she's worried. I can't even watch the news on TV because I start crying, she says. How is this possible? Someone let this happen. People here trust our soldiers to finish the job, Andrei says and to win. At the market, Regina is selling vegetables from her garden. The most important thing, Regina says, is that war doesn't come here, that they don't get all the way here. Our soldiers, especially the commanders, must be more vigilant. Keep in mind, this is a nation which is constantly being reminded by those in power here of the horrors of the Second World War, the horrors of invasion. World War II is very much part of the national psyche here. And now, for the first time in more than 80 years, you have foreign fighters on Russian soil seizing Russian territory. That's quite a shock. Vladimir is worried, but thinks that Russia will achieve victory. What exactly is victory in this war, I ask him. Victory is when there'll be peace, he says. On the town square, a patriotic pop concert. But the atmosphere is pretty subdued. People do seem worried, very worried, by the situation in Kursk region, by the Ukrainian attack. People do want peace, there's no doubt about it. But here's the thing, they still seem to trust the man at the top, the man running the country, President Putin, to secure that peace for them. The same leader who two and a half years ago launched the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. UN agencies are appealing for two seven-day ceasefires in the Israel-Hamas conflict to allow for a mass polio vaccination campaign. A 10-month-old baby has been confirmed with the highly infectious condition, Gaza's first polio case in 25 years. Simon Eccleshaw is from Médecins Sans Frontières and is with me in the studio. Simon, thanks so much for coming in. You're welcome. Uh, how devastating a situation could this become? This is really devastating news. As you're aware, polio is a highly infectious, highly contagious disease. It typically affects our children under the age of five. And unfortunately, one in 200 children who get infected with the polio virus will suffer irreversible paralysis. So it's a very concerning condition that there's been now one and suspected more cases of polio in the Gaza Strip. Do we know what proportion of young children, babies, are not vaccinated against polio? Yes, we have a pretty good idea. The vaccination coverage rate in Gaza was excellent. As you mentioned, 25 years ago, we were able to eradicate polio in Gaza. Since 2022, we estimate that the rate of vaccination has dropped from about 99% of children to now below 90%, and that's causing the risk of a massive outbreak of polio. So this is the first baby, this 10-month-old, uh, to have polio in Gaza for, as you say, 25 years. How has this disease re-emerged? 
Yes, it's a very good question. There's suspicion that the, the virus uh, that uh, is, is, is there with polio has entered Gaza in the last few months, perhaps since the end of 2023, possibly from a neighbouring region such as Egypt. But until the epidemiology is done on the virus, we won't know exactly what strain it is. Mm. Um, but it, in these sort of extremely unhygienic conditions that a, a, a disease like polio is able to thrive, and we can't emphasise enough just how much water, the sanitation and the hygiene play an impact in the spread of an outbreak of polio. And how much is time of the essence, Simon? How soon do you it's have critical. to get in there? Yes, Ros, we need to get in with those vaccination campaigns immediately. As you've mentioned, there's been a call for a ceasefire, two periods of seven days, to enable hundreds of vaccination teams to enter Gaza thousands of health, work, health workers to try and administer an estimated 1.6 million vaccine doses to over 640,000 Palestinian children. Mm. That's a massive effort required. Are you optimistic of getting those two ceasefires? And who are you asking? Who are you mm. going to for this? So uh, we would love to be optimistic and we are really calling on the government of Israel and Hamas to allow a humanitarian pause enough time for medical teams to enter Gaza to be able to do this vaccination. We have the vaccines, we have the resources to be able to do it. It really requires agreement from both parties to the conflict to a short humanitarian pause. Of course, that will only address the vaccination. What we need to really do is work on addressing the water, the sanitation, the hygiene issues mm. that have been created where 1.7 million people are living in a tiny strip of land, and that requires a permanent ceasefire. But on that vaccination campaign, how do you roll such a large-scale operation out? How many people would you have to, to reach to, to vaccinate? Well, as I said, the, the target would be 640,000 children. That would require thousands of health workers mobilising the entire health force within Gaza. And, yes, it would be a mammoth undertaking. Mm. It would require... Uh, days and days of training and administration in vaccine uh, in, or as I've said, very unhygienic conditions. So it's, it's a tall order, even if we are given that, that window of seven days. And you still have MSF personnel on the ground in Gaza, do you? We do. We have MSF workers providing immediate health care to the victims of the conflict. We're treating still a lot of war wounded. We're treating complex uh, injuries. There's trauma patients. There's people with ongoing chronic diseases that don't get access to health care. So we're desperately trying to medically evacuate people and, where possible, substitute for a broken health system inside Gaza. Simon Eccleshaw, thank you. You're welcome. The UK government has announced plans to treat hatred of women as a form of extremism. A review of the UK's counter-terrorism strategy has been ordered to determine how best to tackle threats posed by harmful interpretations of ideologies. While in favour, Dr Sarah Meager from the University of Melbourne says isolating misogyny on its own could prove problematic for tackling radicalisation. Generally, I'm in favour of, you know, this move to try and better understand what the connection is. But I think perhaps isolating uh, extreme misogyny as its own form of violent extremism, rather than understanding how it underpins and is causal of various forms of violent extremism, as our research finds, might be a bit problematic. Because by segmenting it off as, as its own isolated form of ideology and maybe associated only with incel um, extremism, for example, this misses how uh, a number of varieties of political ideology across the right-wing spectrum, uh, Islamism, even amongst left-wing extremist groups, misogyny in our research was found to be a causal factor amongst all these forms. The federal government has been slammed by one of its own MPs for briefing lobbyists before its own caucus on legislating a partial ban on gambling ads. Mike Freelander called the move disgusting and said Labour was being softened up by the gambling industry. Let's go to our chief digital political correspondent, Jacob Grieber, who's in Canberra. Uh, so, Jacob, why is Mr Freelander so frustrated? So, uh, uh, Mike Freelander is a, a backbencher. He's also a doctor uh, and has a very strong view uh, on things from the health perspective. 
and he's become very frustrated that this whole issue uh, has been briefed out to the, the government's preferred position has been briefed out to the industry, by which I mean the TV station owners that get this gambling revenue and also the, uh, the sporting codes. Uh, and he's frustrated that the debate has sort of gone in the direction of being concerned about the revenue for the TV uh, side of things rather than the health issue that he sees as linked to gambling. So he sees this very much as a mental health, family health uh, issue uh, and it's being sort of turned into by government ministers themselves who've spoken on the issue, it's being turned into a sort of media policy issue. And what's the Prime Minister's position? So uh, Prime Minister has made it pretty clear that he wants a solution that does not kill revenue for the television stations. He's indicated that he doesn't want to have unintended consequence of a complete ban, which is what uh, Dr Mike Freelander and a group of others in the caucus are pushing for. Uh, it's the position that was uh, de detailed in a report more than a year ago by the late Peter Murphy, uh, an MP, who chaired an inquiry into this issue. That recommended a strong ban and, uh, and the Prime Minister is obviously concerned uh, uh, about picking a fight essentially with TV station owners and big sporting codes this close to an election. And Jacob, when's the government expected to reach a resolution on this? So the government's been quite cagey about its timeline on this issue. We do know uh, and understand that there will be a briefing given to some of the crossbench uh, members of parliament this evening by the communications minister, Michelle Rowland. Uh, there's also a caucus meeting tomorrow here in Canberra uh, that could see this issue aired. Uh, and then some of the, the hard no full ban uh, groups uh, are being told they've got until the end of this week to make their case to the department. So the, 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 there's still a lot of movement here. There are some who are saying that their concerns are being heard, but there's also a view that the Prime Minister and the senior ministry very much has a view that this needs to go through in the form that we've been told it currently is, which is for a partial ban. Uh, ads can still run two per hour, uh, and uh, that's sort of not during the game, but before and after. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Roz. Increasing extreme weather events are the main driver of rising home insurance costs. That's according to new data by the Insurance Council of Australia. The Insurance Catastrophe Resilience Report out today warns the impact these events are having on the economy has more than tripled over the past three decades. Andrew Hall, the CEO of the Insurance Council of Australia, joins us now. Good to have you with us, uh, Andrew. So by how much has the cost of people's insurance increased? Well, we've seen uh, increases over the last couple of years that have been the largest for a number of decades in Australia. And these have been driven by three key factors. The first has been the extreme weather events. And we've seen five out of the last six years impact particularly home and contents insurance quite heavily. Uh, on top of that, we've had inflation. And we've seen home building costs increase around 27%. And I don't think we've seen the end of those increases. So when an insurer is pricing your home, they're looking at the, the cost of a total replacement. And then, of course, the, the third knock-on effect has been the international reinsurance markets who provide the capital backstop for insurers in Australia. Uh, they've had to increase their rates now between 20 and 30 per cent over the last two years. And that's because uh, Australia, like North America and other parts of the globe, keep experiencing extreme weather events, particularly in areas of high population. Mm. So you say that uh, increasing extreme weather events are the main pressure on increasing home insurance uh, costs. Which events in particular have been the biggest problem? Well, flooding is our number one issue in Australia. And the reason for that is we know that there's around 220,000 homes approximately that were built in a 1 in 20 flood zone or a 5% chance that they will flood every year. And the problem with a flood is that it's very predictable. We know where a flood will happen. We know often the frequency or the severity of it to which it could happen. And pricing that, particularly where you've got a home that floods uh, three times in five years, makes them very expensive. Uh, what we're saying to governments, both at the local, state and the federal level, is we need to work together on better data. 
we need to be able to narrow down those areas that are costing a lot of money to insure and work on what we can do to make them more resilient and mitigate against those problems. In Australia, we've got a growing population. A lot of people want to live in nice areas along the coast. Uh, we've seen enormous population growth and pressures in our three major capital cities on the east coast. But unfortunately, a lot of that land that's been developed is on floodplains. So we're going to need to go back and, first of all, fix up past mistakes, but moving forward, we need to make sure that the decisions that local government and state governments make about where to put homes are indeed the right ones. Mm. And how have these um, extreme weather events then, Andrew, affected the insurance premiums for people who aren't living in those affected areas? Well, the challenge is, is that insurance is all about pooling risk. So everybody's premiums go into a pool to pay the claims of the few. Only we've had the claims of many, many people. In fact, year on year there was around 66,000 more claims for home and contents because of the catastrophe events than there were last year. And we actually had a quiet summer. In fact, insurers are starting to recover their profitability, which is a, a good thing because as profitability recovers, we will see uh, a moderation of the premium increases. But effectively, insurance prices risk We've got to get back to the core of, of what we're dealing with here, and that is an ageing uh, stock of homes in this country built in some of the wrong locations that we can do a better job of protecting into the future. Finally, Andrew, even in the face of increasing extreme weather events, is there a way for people to keep their insurance premiums down? You should always shop around. It's a very competitive insurance market, so always get online when you get your renewal and check other companies to make sure that you're paying the best deal. Talk to your insurer. Tell them uh, what it is about your home. They may not have that information uh, that makes your home safe. There are now, uh, in bushfire areas, for example, you can use the Resilient Building Council's app and demonstrate that you have a more resilient home than maybe other homes. So insurers are looking to work with customers to understand the risks around their homes. And maintaining your home is always the number one priority. Keep, we're, in, we're approaching spring now, clear your gutters, make sure that uh, any overgrowth and, and, and the like around your home is cleared away. If you can reduce the risk, you can reduce your premium. Andrew Hall, thank you. My pleasure. Time for finance news now with Sam Yang. Hi, Sam. So the prices of iron ore are plummeting, and that's a worry for the government. Yeah, that's right. The federal government is warning that plummeting iron ore prices could cost the government up to $3 billion in revenue in the next few years. So that's significantly going to impact uh, the government's uh, bottom line. So iron ore prices at the start of this year were around $144 US dollars per tonne, and that have been uh, gradually declining all year. But the decline has accelerated in recent weeks, with prices now sitting at around $92 uh, dollars, US dollars per tonne. Prices have dropped to their lowest level in two years as China's property crisis cuts demand for steel. So that means it's going to put pressure on Australia's resources companies. Now, Treasurer Jim Chalmers says it's a reminder that Australia is not immune from volatility in the global market, Ross. And the corporate reporting season uh, continues. Which companies have we heard from today? Yeah, it's still early in the reporting season, but so far so good uh, after all, uh, despite a few um, ugly results that had uh, investors heading for the exits. Westpac is out today. So Westpac has posted a 6% increase in third quarter profit to $1.8 billion. The bank reported a slight expansion in margins uh, while markets and treasury income along with some hedging uh, were a drag on the result. Uh, the 2% increase in net interest income reflecting both higher margins and more loans being written. Expenses increased by 2% due to a larger investment spend and inflation related costs on technology services. Its tier prices uh, is up around 1.8% to $30.20. If we don't provide the pain 
Meanwhile, property giant Land Lease has plummet, uh, plummeted into the red, announcing a $1.5 billion loss, a steep decline from last year's $232 million loss. The bulk of the loss was made up of $1.3 billion in red ink of what the company called strategy-related impairments, such a write-down in goodwill, development uh, impairments and uh, redundancy costs. Land leases preferred measure core operating profit after tax came in at uh, $263 million, up marginally from the year before. Now, CEO Tony Lombardo says significant, significant progress had been made in creating a simpler, more focused business. Its share price is down around 0.5% to $6.32 per share. Now, Ros, uh, the ASX is currently trading fairly flat, just um, up around five points at this stage. Um, it was um, down 0.1 percent early in early trade, but now it's fairly flat, heading into the afternoon session. The uh, Aussie dollar is uh, trading a little stronger against the greenback. It's buying around 66.8 US cents, and that's finance. Thanks, Sam. For many kids, problems with language and literacy don't show up until they start learning to read. But a new screening tool developed in the UK can be used on children under five to identify language disorders early. It's been trialled at schools across Tasmania with the hope that early intervention will lead to very different literacy outcomes. These kinder kids have big plans for the future. I want to be a policeman. A Spider-Man. I think I want to be Batman. <laughs> They're just starting out on their educational journey. I like reading. But before they really get into learning letters, they're being screened to see whether they may be at risk of reading difficulties. This is a grey cat. This is a grey cat. <gasps> you did it. I think you're clever. The Grammar and Phonology screen, or GAPS, is being trialled at schools in Tasmania. Children are asked to repeat simple sentences and made-up words. Defrimple. It helps identify any issues with language. It's non-confrontational, it's so easy and so relaxed, it's just lovely. One in 14 children have a developmental language disorder, which is a difficulty understanding and using language. It can't be identified just by hearing a child speak, but this screening tool can pick it up. It's raising those red flags really early. It's a really big marker for their future literacy because literacy completely depends on language ability. If an issue is identified, Parents, teachers and sometimes speech pathologists can work with a child to expand vocabulary and language. For example, when we're getting dinner ready and we're sitting eating dinner, um, it can be as simple as looking at the vegetables and talking about them and bringing in words like crunchy and juicy. I think it's great for parents so they can get on top of the problem and good for the child as well, basically so they don't feel behind. I'm very happy that they're doing it at this age because I, well, I struggled a lot in school. Tackling literacy issues early means opening the door to future opportunities. Because they go and play now. Fiona Blackwood, ABC News. Sport now with Daniela Intilly. Hi, Danny. Uh, let's start with the NRL. Cronulla pulled off a thrilling golden point win, but the Knights are fuming. Yeah, indeed. Of course, it's we're, clo we're at close to the end of the season, and uh, the Knights were actually leading 18-10 uh, just uh, before a controversial sim bending to halfback of Phoenix, Crossland and Ross. That pretty much changed the course of the game because the Sharks fought back. It was 18 all at the final whistle and Daniel Atkinson uh, with the winning field goal at the end for Cronulla. The Roosters had already secured third spot earlier with a 16-point win over the Gold Coast. But for Newcastle now, their finals hopes have all but ended because of the loss. And the coach, uh, Adam O'Brien, hit out at the match referee Jared Sutton over the contentious calls that led to the Sharks winning the Golden Pointer. Let's have a listen. 
shocked if anybody agreed. Like, that was the third infringement for the half, so I think we had one for offside at a scrum, which happens a lot, and we only had one for slowing the ruck down. And on the third one, he puts a bloke in the bin. Like, is, that, is that a harsh standard? And uh, Roz, in the NRLW, it was a win for Parramatta against the West Tigers, uh, their third win of the season, just by two points in Campbelltown. Converted tries from Monique Donovan and Kennedy Sherrington doing enough for the Eels to consolidate third position. Victories also for the Sharks and Roosters. On to AFL then, an injury ravaged Carlton pulled off a crucial win. Yeah, an extraordinary win. 17 players were unavailable for the Blues because of this injury crisis, including their two big forwards. Uh, but uh, went on to beat West Coast by 65 points at uh, in Perth. So extraordinary. And that win keeps Carlton just in the top eight with one round of the regular season remaining. Well, just quickly, the English Premier League is back. Yeah, Manchester City picking up from where it left off with a 2-0 win against Chelsea. Erling Haaland opened the scoring and it was uh, Mateo Kovacic in the second half that secured that win. Brentford, meanwhile, beat Crystal Palace 2-1. Thanks, Danny. On the satellite, there's cloud across WA South and on the border to South Australia with an intense low and in fronts generating gusty showers with storms developing across the state. Wet southerlies in the east are bringing showers to parts of eastern New South Wales. High pressure is keeping elsewhere mostly dry. Looking around the country, mostly sunny for Queensland, mild in the southern parts of the state. Clearing showers in the north of New South Wales, fog in much of the south with sunnier and milder conditions in the west. Cloudy in the southwest of Victoria, while the southeast sees clearing fog, late showers in the northeast. A mixed day for Tasmania, fog in the southeast with patchy cloud and some sun for the rest of the state, stay mostly dry. In South Australia, late showers over central with clearing showers in the west, windy and showers for the north. WA sees a mixed day with cool and rainy conditions in the south with a hot and sunny day in the north. And in the NT, a mostly warm and sunny day for the Territory with some wind and very warm conditions in the south. Let's look ahead to tomorrow's forecast for the capital cities. Brisbane, a possible shower, mostly sunny for Sydney. A late shower for Canberra, possible showers for Melbourne. Mostly cloudy in Hobart, a late shower for Adelaide. Perth can expect a possible shower and a hot day reaching into the 30s for Darwin. And that's ABC News for now. I'm Ros Childs. Thanks for being with us uh, on the first day of the new look ABC News. A comprehensive redesign has been rolled out across visual platforms, including a new look for the news website. And the iconic ABC News theme is back for the first time in nearly 20 years. Thanks for your company. From the incredible. I just 